I'm Yanir Baryam. I am the prof I'm professor and president of the New England Complex Systems Institute. And um, we are currently working on stopping the coronavirus outbreak. So I understand that the well, complexity science is well positioned to tackle issues uh, of this nature. Can you explain uh, why that is and why uh, the approaches that seem to have been taken around the world may not have worked and what the, the problems uh, could actually okay. be there? So um, complexity science or complex system science is about the math that um, enables us to go beyond calculus and statistics. So uh, calculus assumes things are smooth, statistics assume things are independent, um, and they are unable to correctly describe the way dependencies in a system give rise to collective behaviors, including as a matter of, uh, for clarity, the existence of large dynamical behaviors. So things where many parts of the system do something different than they normally do. And uh, they also are not good at describing transitions of the system uh, from one condition to another, like boiling water. So um, it's a math that is really necessary for describing pandemic type behaviors. Um, but um, um, so there's a piece of complex system science which is really uh, critical for thinking about problems. So the complex system science, because it's kind of this math beyond has many different manifestations. So there's nonlinear dynamics and there's networks and there's agent-based models and all kinds of other ways of describing mathematically what's going on in a system. But ultimately what complexity science does is not, it's not as much about the equations as about what are the right variables. And, um, and this is, um, this becomes clear when you deal with complex problems where many people think that if you have a lot of complexity, the solution is to talk about all the details. But it's very clear that therein lies madness. You can't describe all the details of a real world system. So the, the real um, strategy um, that works is actually to um, identify what are the most important variables. And by focusing on the most important variables, you have clarity about what it is that you're trying to describe. And you can build the right equations, which you can't do if you don't have the right variables. It doesn't really make sense. So as an example, we can take the current pandemic. And there are a lot of models that epidemiologists who are experts in pandemics or diseases in general have developed. But they tend to focus a lot on details and are really concerned about getting sort of the equations precise maybe. Whereas uh, it's, it's really enough to know a few really basic things. One of them is that disease is a terrible disease. It has, you know, 80% mild cases, which tends to fool people because it's, so it's kind of deceptive, but it has 20% that are severe cases requiring hospitalization. People can't breathe for a long period of time. And then 6% of the total require ventilators. So they, they're, they're near death. And 4%, and about 2 to 4% die. And, and that's really a bad, very bad situation. So it's a terrible disease. 
And it's enough to know that. The second thing that you need to know is that it's really fast. So it multiplies by a factor of 10 every week about. And there was a lot of confusion about this early on because until the disease kind of takes hold in a population, the transmission processes are not uh, fully exploited. And that still has to be understood why that works. But once it's in the population, um, in a, in a sufficient numbers, which is only a few tens or maybe a hundred, um, then it propagates at a rate that multiplies the number of cases, the number of everything by a factor of 10 every week. And that means that it doesn't look like a lot. And two weeks later, it's a hundred times as much. And two weeks after that, it's 10,000 times what you started from. So people have a tendency to think it's not important and exponential growth is really hard for many people to think about because they're used to things being constant and they don't understand that things can grow rapidly. And part of that is that people have this tendency that is reinforced by studying statistics to believe that the normal that they know is the normal that will be. Because in statistics, everything is a normal distribution and you never deviate from the average by more than a couple of standard deviations, maybe three sometimes. And so you don't expect anything surprising to happen. Um, but it does in the real world. Um, and, that's, and, and it does in such a way, and, and, and again, this is really hard for people to grasp, that the world doesn't remain the same. And now we have experience of that in the world because of this pandemic. It will change everybody's understanding of what can happen in the world. But before this happened, everybody was kind of convinced that the normal was the normal. And when things changed so that people were uh, in severe situations and lockdowns and so on, all of a sudden people thought that that was the new normal. And again, they, they have this idea that things that happen remain the same. So if it's this way, it must be going, going to be this way for years or at least surely many months. So the, the second thing that we need to know is that it's really fast. Okay. And the third thing that we need to know is that we can stop it. Did we understand both the mechanisms of transmission enough to stop it? And we also have experience that it's possible to stop it and what was done in China and South Korea early on in the process. But somehow there is this built-in perspective that number one, it's either not important or there's nothing you can do about it. Both of which are related to what people can choose to do. And one of the biggest challenges that we've been facing in talking about this is to understand that prediction is not the purpose of mathematics. Always. There's a lecture that I gave, it's, it's available in video format, a number of years ago, where I talked about prediction. And I explained there, already at the very beginning of that lecture, that it's not true that prediction is always the objective. You can predict something that will happen and you lose the opportunity to change it. And recognizing that we actually have an opportunity to make a difference is what's important in this outbreak. Saying to yourself, hey, it's not necessary that things happen. The purpose is not telling you, you know, I don't want to just look in a crystal ball and say, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen. But to realize that whatever happens is actually a choice that we're making. And we're making a choice between life and death. It really is that kind of a choice. So um, the, the key statements are, number one, it's a terrible disease, we don't want it. Number two, it's really fast, which means that we have to act fast. And number three, we can act and we can stop it. So I was involved in pandemics since 2006, where we showed that adding long range transportation in a model, a simple spatial model, 
causes a transition, a transition from local extinctions by disease to global extinction. And it's not that you have progressively larger outbreaks, but there is a boundary at which you end up with the, the global extinctions. And that was very scary because every few days or every few weeks, they would announce a new flight from, from Boston, New York, wherever it was, to some faraway place. And so recognizing that there is this global vulnerability that we are approaching that we don't understand how to deal with was something that I tried to talk about since 2006. Couldn't get much traction because everyone's focused on a statistical view. The past and the future are always going to be the same. Over the, the past few months, uh, there's been, a, I would say, a lot of talk, but a lot more talk about um, the precautionary principle. And I know that uh, you wrote a paper with uh, Nassim Taleb and uh, Joe Norman, um, I think, that uh, spoke a little bit about this. Um, could you just talk about what um, the precautionary principle is and what are problems with traditional uh, cost benefit analyses? Sure. Um, so the precautionary principle is designed to create a limitation on what policymakers are kind of entitled to do. So we entrust policymakers with decision making that is relevant to society as a whole. And the basic statement of the precautionary principle is that don't take big risks, don't even take small risks. Because if you take small risks that, and I'm not talking about small risks in scale, but small probabilities of destroying the entire society. Uh, if you do that once, maybe you get away with it. But if you do it many times, eventually, the society will go away. So you have to be really, really careful about taking risks for all of the world. And, and part of the statement is that we, we experiment, we do things that influence the whole world. And, and the, the, the scientific question is, do we have to prove that it's safe? Or do we have to prove that it's going to be a risk? And the answer is, if you're going to do something that is going to affect the whole world, you better have a strong proof that it's not going to be a real risk. Because otherwise, you're going to be gone. So the precautionary principle is a statement about the need for being careful when risking everything. And um, you know, so an individual you know, they make a choice to go skydiving or, you know, um, you know, something else. And we allow them to take risks, right? People climb Mount Everest and, and a fair fraction of them die. And that we allow people to make risks like that because they're making a choice for themselves. But we don't want someone to make a choice for everybody, even if we elected them or they somehow became into office. Um, so, so the precautionary principle is about that. And in the case of a pandemic, uh, it's, it's, quote, obvious that the world is at risk if you understand what's going on, though many people, again, don't know that the normal is not stable, that they are taking risks. So the paper that we wrote was about, again, two things. Number one, that you cannot assume that things are going to be OK. You're not allowed to do that. And the second thing is that you have to know that you can act, that there are things that you can do that make a difference. And in this case, it's not about um, the actions that you take, but inaction. So the, it's an imperative to act in a context of global risk because you have to make sure that the world doesn't get destroyed. Yeah, inaction is a form of action in of itself. Like the results, like the time still goes on. There's nothing, like you can't just sit there and analyze because the, the number of cases just keeps the going up. The dynamic is there. You know, yeah. That you don't have a choice about. 
you don't have a choice about the disease dynamics. You do have a choice about what you do about it. Yeah. So the who has, or the, you know, the World Health Organization has drawn some criticism uh, over the, uh, the past few months for how they've approached this problem. Um, you would think that, I mean, I definitely thought that they would have these sorts of um, principles like the precautionary principle in mind when making, when, when giving uh, their, their advice. Um, do you know if they have any experts in complex systems or people who are aware of, I guess, risk? So, and we have a structural problem with the WHO. The structural problem has to do with their political sensitivities, right? That they're trying to be very careful not to annoy anybody. And when you have an outbreak, you can't tell people things that make them happy. You have to tell people things that have to do with the reality. And one of the, one of the key things that we've been having trouble with in society in general is recognizing that actions have consequences. People make up all kinds of pretend ideas about what the world is about and advocate for those ideas. And they're generally harmful. They're quite generally very harmful. But, you know, very often the people who are advocating for those are not the ones who are suffering from the consequences. So they keep doing it, which is not a good thing. And, and that's something that I've been warning about for some time. But in this case, uh, the consequences are pretty quick. So, um, and the consequences are devastating. And people made a lot of mistakes because of belief in a lot of crazy things that are not true. So one of the problems that we've had with the WHO is, and, and one the central one, is that the most basic control over diseases um, is they don't think that one should use it. And you're and referring like, to masks? No. Oh, no. It's actually further down on the list, it's travel restrictions. It's what's called cordon sanitaire. It's the statement that if you have a disease, you draw a boundary around it and you prevent it from getting out of where it is. And, and there's a big misunderstanding in the world still today about the role of lockdowns. There's a really brilliant interview of the head of the Chinese response that was published in Science Magazine not too long ago. And he's asked about, you know, what, what is needed to be done. And he says, the lockdown, that's cordon sanitaire. When they locked down Wuhan, it wasn't about the social distancing. It was about the travel restrictions. That's what lockdown really means. They didn't want the disease to leave the area where it was and go other places. And even if it had leaked out a little bit, you still want to stop it mostly because the other places where there's a little bit, you can defeat it much easier. Why would you want to get more of it? Why would you want it to spread everywhere? So they were very clear. The WHO was not very comfortable about it. In fact, they're not even very comfortable about social interventions altogether. Because, and they, they have a big report and people call them non-pharmaceutical interventions. It's like everything should be pharma. And aside from that, you know, maybe you'll think about something else. But when you don't have a pharmacological solution, uh, 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 you know, we can do stuff. People can do things. Society can do things. But that's not what doctors know about. It's not in their domain. And, and so, and, and epidemiologists or doctors don't study it, even though they do some mathematical modeling. They don't study what society can do. And even though they've been modeling some of it recently, because after all, that's what China did and that's what the whole world is doing, it, it's not their domain of expertise. 
And it's in fact, it's even hard to point to whose domain of expertise it is to know about, you know, what do you do in terms of social distancing or in terms of having crowds meet or not meet or, or closing businesses? Who's the expert in knowing what to do? And part of the reason is that we don't have experience, so you can't apply statistics to it, right? After the fact, maybe, yes, a little bit. But even then, it's very hard to understand what people are doing in different parts of the world. So there's a structural problem with expertise and understanding. And you need very general mathematical concepts that are not based upon statistical understanding. And that's not what traditional science offers. So it really requires a complex systems thinking where you can generalize the principles. Now, cordon sanitaire is a very fundamental strategy but we can understand where it comes from using complex systems math. And the basic analysis goes something like this. If you think about a pandemic, what are the most important variables in the problem? And the answer is one of those absolutely most important relevant variables is transportation. Because without transportation, you don't have a pandemic. And with transportation, as I told you, we have this transition, phase transition, from having local extinctions to having global extinctions. So it's obviously a relevant variable. So if you, if you don't allow yourself to use that relevant variable in controlling a, a pandemic, it's like tying your hands behind your back. And that's what WHO has been doing. And the math is clear. And the traditional experience going back centuries is clear. But if you embed yourself in modern medicine, you say, hey, we don't do that stuff anymore. And besides, it has a lot of economic consequences. And again, epidemiologists are not in a position to judge economic consequences, particularly. There are not many people are when it comes to doing such big interventions. Is that clear? Yep, yep. So, so we have this structural problem with WHO that they're very conservative, small c, about the nature of what they do because they want to base everything on double blind experiments or something like that. And you can't wait for that in a, in a world that is not normal. So in 2014, in January, I spoke at WHO and I told them about this model that you know, the, the world was vulnerable and that there were going to be much larger outbreaks. And I specifically focused on Ebola because we knew that Ebola was a horrendous disease in Africa that was only in villages, but Africa was developing. And so I warned about that. And in our paper, we also warned about SARS-like diseases, which is what the coronavirus is. Respiratory diseases. Um, and two months, so, so you could see that the people in the room that I was talking to at WHO, their jaws dropped, right? Because, I mean, it's not that they didn't respect our work, but they didn't act on it. Um, and two months later, the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa started in March. You, I mean, it was very clear. And it ended up being 10 times as large as, more than 10 times as large as any previous outbreak. Now that is a really important, right? Because in a normal distribution, you don't have something that's 10 times as big happen. It just doesn't happen. And again, there are two reasons for this. One is that we have potential of fat tail distributions, extreme events. And the other one is because we're going through a transition in which case you can end up with global extinctions. Now, what I found really disturbing was that people again said, we can't do travel restrictions. And I spoke with people who were doing simulations, including complexity scientists. And I said to them, we've got to have people change what they're doing in order to solve this problem. And they told me, no, no, that, that never happens. You can't do that. So I explained to people what needed, what was necessary to do. And it's, again, it's a mathematical statement. 
And the standard approach is individually based. So a person comes to a hospital, they have Ebola. And, they, and you see that they're, so you see that they're sick. So you say to them, who did you touch? And you take those people and you find them in the community, you isolate them. But that might work in a village, but it doesn't work if you go to an urban area like Monrovia and Liberia, you just can't find people. So what do you do? And the answer is in a complex systems perspective, you change scale. Scale is the important, the multi-scale thinking is the important way to think about systems. So you stop thinking at the individual level and you think at the community level. So you have to go into the community. You can use travel restrictions to, to, to cordon sanitaire on communities, which is really important. But in Ebola, you can actually solve the problem even without those restrictions. You can't do that for every disease and you can't do it for, for um, the coronavirus. But what you could do is you could go into the community and you could go in the community and look for cases of early symptoms. And the reason you could do that is because when early symptoms, these are just normal cold symptoms, someone with a temperature happens. When you detect that and you isolate them, then you prevent transmission. With the coronavirus, you can't do that because you have asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic transmission. Not asymptomatic, but pre-symptomatic transmission. In other words, before someone has symptoms, they're already contagious. So with, with Ebola, the outbreak went up exponentially, and then it went down exponentially. And again, the people who said you couldn't do that, they were projecting 10 million people dead. Now, we ended up with 10 times as many people um, sick and dying, but it was only 10,000 and not 10 million. So it was a tenth of a percent of the risk locally. And it was much smaller than that in terms of risk global. And if we didn't have travel restrictions and it would grow the way they were claiming, it would have devastated the world, not just West Africa. So I was very upset with people for not allowing for travel restrictions. But I want to explain why people didn't think about travel restrictions. Because it's not just because they didn't understand math, it's because they didn't write down the right mathematical models. And that's really important because when you're a scientist and you're studying science in academia and you write a paper it's really fine and okay if you write down an assumption at the beginning of the paper and at the end of the paper you come to some conclusion. It's fine because you're trying to expand knowledge. But if that gets to a policymaker and the policymaker acts on it, that's really not good. If you're going to write policy, you have to make sure that the assumptions that you started with are correct. They have to be valid. They have to be validatable and they have to be valid. And one has to understand what the implications are of making policies based upon assumptions that are just assumptions. And, and, and here is one of these cases where people make assumptions and the assumptions are wrong. And in doing so, they give wrong policy advice and they cost lives, really. That was happening with Ebola at the time. And there was a big risk that it would have been much worse. And we see that risk today in the coronavirus where people wrote down mathematical models, policymakers took them seriously because after all, these are the experts and they know how to write mathematical models that will predict what's gonna happen. Remember prediction? Um, and they had the wrong assumptions. So what were those assumptions? So imagine that you have an outbreak and it's in location X, like Wuhan or in West Africa. And you have an exponentially growing dynamic, right? And the exponentially growing dynamic is 10 times per week. And now you impose travel restrictions, okay? 
great, we have travel restrictions, but it's kind of boring if you assume that your travel restrictions are going to work all the way. And you can imagine that, you know, hey, it's not going to really work all the way. So let's assume a number, a 1%. It's good for a paper. So you assume that there's a 1% leakage. So remember that the case rate is going up by a factor of 10 and a factor of 10 every week. So two weeks later, you have 100 times as many cases. And the number of cases that are getting out is only 1% of the total number of cases. So all you've done is bought yourself two weeks, right? And two weeks, all right, so two weeks is not a big deal. So why should we do travel restrictions altogether? Now, where does the assumptions of this model break down? So you could argue that the assumptions break down because maybe it's not 1%, maybe it's a tenth of a percent or a hundredth of a percent. Then you gain a month, right? Maybe that's better. But the real reason why it breaks down is that they assume that you didn't do anything in the city where the outbreak started. You took no action to, to reduce the outbreak, right? And that's wrong, right? In Wuhan, they reduced the outbreak. And going back to West Africa, we stopped the outbreak there. Okay, the people there stopped it. By the way, just to be clear, I was advocating for this, but they did it themselves. Okay, I didn't, I was not the one who, you know, influenced them to do it. They figured it out themselves. Later in DRC, in the Congo, I was involved in implementing, but in, in uh, West Africa, they did it themselves. So the point is that in China also, they did it themselves. I didn't tell them what to do. They knew how to do it because they thought it through. And in some sense, it's obvious if you think it through in a direct way and you don't think about mathematical models with all kinds of crazy assumptions that are not correct about the world. But the main thing is by cutting off the long range transportation, they gave themselves a chance. They gave themselves a real chance to implement the actions that would suppress the output. So these things work together. And again, working together and not independently is what complex systems is about. So you don't separate the travel restrictions that you might implement from the, you know, lockdown that you might, you know, the, 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 whatever, the social distancing that you might implement. You think about them together. And when you do them together, all of a sudden you can win, which you couldn't do with each one separately. So that's really important. So we have this situation, just to summarize, where people believe the travel restrictions don't work because they made already the prior assumption that behavioral change in society is not possible and that no intervention locally will work. So why intervene globally? And that's crazy, honestly, totally crazy. But that's what the WHO believes in until today. It's not just that they believe that before this outbreak started. And it's not to even after they were surprised by the fact that China was able to implement all these behavioral changes. They weren't able to dial back in their minds and figure out where their assumptions were that created these conclusions that you don't have need travel restrictions. Is it clear? Yeah, yep. Yeah. It seems as though that uh, complexity science is the, a branch of science or a completely new way of doing things that we so desperately need in these times, um, not just because of the coronavirus, but because of you know, um, the, emergent, the, the slew of emergent crises that we face from, you know, uh, climate change to biosphere collapse, just to name a few. Um, do you think that COVID-19 is a harbi like a harbinger of um, future global threats? And what other things do you think we should be aware of? Like, given that we've had this, this scare um, that uh, it's, you know, well, you know, um, quite bad, it could have been a lot worse. Um, do you, th what do you think we, sh uh, what other things do you think we should be aware of um, moving forward? Other potential threats? So it's a little bit hard today with the coronavirus where it is to start talking about, you know, future things. But the fact that a connected world is vulnerable as an entity that, that kind of we're all in it together has been something that we've been clear about. It's, it's kind of obvious, right? When, when the world is a bunch of villages that, you know, once in a while, you know, one person goes from one village to another. If something happens in one village, 
it doesn't necessarily influence what's happening in another village far away. But when we're connected, when our supply chains are connected, when our communications are connected, when our transportation is connected, when our um, infrastructure is connected and all of that, anything that happens is a global risk. And we, we spend a fair amount of time looking at the fi global financial crisis and understanding what happened there. And there were policy decisions, remember the precautionary principle, that were done in one place that cascaded around the world. It turns out that the Arab Spring was triggered by U.S. policies in, in agriculture and in, and in, um, and in uh, financial markets. Um, so, so, and sorry, then the Arab Spring triggered the, you know, refugee crisis in Europe. And, and we see these cascades that are propagating around the world. One of them is a disease, which is very clear. You know, again, if one person sneezes, literally, you know, everybody might catch the cold. So we have to take these global risks seriously. And the reason why traditional science is not prepared for this is that they they need statistical samples in order to be able to understand what's going on. And we're, we're not going to get those for large scale events. I mean, once we have one or two of them, we'll be gone. So we don't have that luxury. And we don't have the capacity to actually enforce any of these things. Like in a, in a world where we have, uh, where local actions can have devastating global consequences. We don't have, like the UN doesn't have the, the power to intervene and tell the likes of you know, China or the United States, no, you can't do this because it threatens all of us. You know, if, if yeah, and, and one of the challenges is that, you know, with, with all, you know, uh, that one might say, China did an incredible job saying, we've got to stop this and they take pulling, putting out all the stops and really doing it. But there are not that many countries in the world that, that took the kind of action that they should have. Once China um, showed what serious, how seriously the disease was and what it took to stop it, Again, you would think that everyone else would say, hey, you know, hey, let's not let it get here altogether. Close the borders. Um, but many countries waited until hospitals were, were occupied, which says something about how people think about themselves and about the world, a little bit about arrogance, a little bit about, about, um, about uh, other things. And yeah, I remember. I remember seeing the footage from China it would have been, you know, in January or February, and it just seemed quite extreme from where I was, uh, just compared to, you know, what I was experiencing in my day to day life. And you'd think that if China is reacting in this way, the governments would respond accordingly. But I guess I, got... I don't know. I mean, people were you kept talking about how what, we need to learn how to wash hands as if in China they don't know how to wash their hands. Right. I mean, there's something crazy about how people reacted to it. But I, you know, this is something that, again, requires an understanding of psychology of alienation and psychology of, of, of self perception. Mm. Um, but the but the challenge here now is that what you're pointing to is the need for global governance, global yep. decision making. Yeah. And, and there are two things that are needed. One is, you know, very the ability to exercise that kind of power. And the other one is the ability to do it well. And we need both, you know, because to put, create a power structure that's ineffective is surely not going to be better than having, right. So, so I'm pointing about failure of decision-making because if you put the WHO in charge of the world, they would never impose travel restrictions and we would be in really big trouble, bigger than we are now. Yeah. And, and, and as you pointed out, they didn't want us to wear masks either, which is totally crazy. In fact, the, the head of the Chinese response was asked, what was the biggest mistake people made? And they, he said, masks, right? I mean, 
mass is a way to stop transmission and it's multiplicative. Any form of transmission is a multiplicative process. So if you reduce the probability and people saying masks are only 60 to 70%, so they're not useful. I mean, that's crazy, <laughs> right? Reduce 60%, 70% of the transmission and then multiply it every day or every whatever, two days and see what you get after a week or two. And we know that countries that use masks had many, many fewer cases than countries that didn't. But, but the point is that there's, a, there's this, I, it, it becomes, instead of becoming a science, it becomes an ideology. And the ideology creeps into the mathematical models because you stick your assumptions into the models. So, so we can't solve this problem by putting, creating power structures that are global. We really have to figure out how to make power structures that are effective. And it's very clear that the conventional understanding of power structures is insufficient, right? Because the traditional view in the West has been that democracies are kind of effective. And we surely haven't seen that in this round. Right, the democracies, if anything, were the worst. Now that doesn't mean that you always want autocracies. I didn't say that, but this is a complex systems problem. What is the nature of power structures that are effective? And the answer is, you know, I've written a few papers about it. One of them is called Complexity Rising. That basically explains that in a complex world, you need distributed decision-making processes, but you have to get them right. And this is something that we're starting to learn how to do, but we haven't done very well yet. And so we need global power structures, but we need them to be structured in the right way. Mm. What that makes me think is we need uh, distributed decision-making, like you could think about it at the level of the countries or even city-states where they make lots of their internal decisions, but it needs to be in coherence with a global framework. So they, each city-state needs to act within certain bounds um, and they can they have complete autonomy within those bounds, but they can't step out of, uh, you know, they can't, you know, start developing nuclear weapons or uh, bioweapons or do high particle physics things that could create black holes. So it's a little bit, it, it, the idea that you're talking about is kind of a localism. Yeah. And there's a good reason for localism, but that's actually not the distributed decision making I'm talking about. Because you have your hand doesn't make decisions separately from your, you know, your body, mm. right? Um, but there is a distributed decision-making process. Where is it? Up here, the brain? In your brain. Yeah. The brain is not a centralized, it is centralized relative to the body, but it's distributed in itself. Yeah. So it's more subtle than just saying distributed decision-making in the world we need a distributed decision-making entity. Yeah. Yeah, my point was that entity, we need to form that entity who then gives those frame, passes those frameworks onto the city-states and empowers them. When I say city-states, they, they could be nation-states or whatever, and, and empowers them with autonomous decision-making because you know, they just have access to better information and they can make decisions faster. But that creation of this, this global entity, one that uh, formulates these, these principles and also allocates resources in a way that makes, like improves a lot of, improves the welfare of everyone because not all I, states will be able to re respond accordingly to their problems. And that's something that we've I seen today. This, this, this conversation is probably not the conversation to go into a lot of details about that subject, but it's an important yeah. subject. Yeah, I just think it's one that we really need to be having a lot sooner rather than later, given the, uh, you know, the, the rise of our society, like the exponential growth of our society and our capabilities and our inability to deal with the consequences of our collective actions. And this coronavirus could be a blessing in disguise uh, because it's really making it known how, uh, well, the, th the threats that we face um, yeah, and, well. and the need for global coordination. Because if we don't really, if we don't listen, um, it could be a lot worse and not just worse for humanity, but for, you know, the all of life. Um, 
I'm never happy about saying that something that's this deadly, I wouldn't be happy about saying that it's a blessing in disguise, but yeah, but, that um, might not be the right way but, of phrasing it, but. but regardless, let's hope that we get through it and we learn something from it. So that's maybe the important thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's my main point. Um, I've seen that you, I've seen uh, you writing about, um, ethical values, um, from a multi-scale scientific perspective, and you kind of alluded to it before, uh, with your reference to the body and, you know, organs not working independently from one another, um, that they are, you know, connected in, in some system. Could you talk a little bit about what we can learn from biology uh, with regards to ethics? I think that the, the, the framework that we need to start with is a framework of understanding, um, you know, any, again, I'll use the complex systems framework since you're, you would like me to frame it in that language. Um, there's a difference between systems that are the same as each other and systems that are different from each other. And um, individual people are fundamentally different from each other. They're what we would call non-universal. So if you build a, a, a mass produced item, they're all the same, but there are also many entities that even though if you don't mass produce them, they're, they're basically the same. But human beings are not. What you're good at and what I'm good at are not the same. Otherwise, we would both be able to switch places. You could come over here and do what I'm doing, and I could go over there and do what you're doing. And I couldn't. Because you know stuff, and the kinds of things that you know are different from what I do. And people have this very different view of putting people on a single dimension, you know, single capability dimension measured by some standardized test. And people are not that way. And if you think about it for a minute, you know that because if you have siblings or you have friends, if you have people you interact with, people are really different. They're good at different things. Some people are good at math. Some people are good at writing. The people who are good at math are these people who think in this way and other people think in that way. And it's hard for people even to explain to each other what they're doing because they're so different. And that means that the right way to think about people is that they can be complement each other. That's the best scenario because we're doing things together. So if you do the stuff that you're good at and I do the stuff that I'm good at, you might think about it as superpowers, right? So we have these superpower teams that appear in movies. And the reason that's a good way to think about it is because each one has a very, very different kind of superpower. And if the movie is done well, what you see is that the fact that they have different superpowers means that they work together very well. And that's true in reality, because that's a real reflection of what, we're, what people are about. Now, the point is that in complex systems, you have to think in a multi-scale view. So in your body, you have different cells that are good at different things. The blood cell and the muscle cell and the brain cell and the, you know, the tooth cell are just not the same. And they, the reason why you're able to do what you're doing is because they complement each other and they're not mixed up in the role that they play. And similar in society, we have different people doing different things. And not just people, individuals, but communities. And so there are groups of people at all scales, up to the society is up to the, up to the world. And if you look at the world, you see that, right? There are areas of the world that are this way and there are areas of the world that are that way. And the coronavirus doesn't care. It does treats everyone the same. But in terms of what the society is doing, there are real differences in what people are and doing in different places in the world. So the point is that if that's the case and you think about the issue of values, which is where we started this conversation, then there are two ideas that are not true. One is that everyone should have the same values. And the other one is that values are sort of irrelevant or arbitrary, right? People get confused. Either they say something is absolute this way or something is absolute that way. So it's either values should all be the same or values can all be different and it doesn't matter what you choose. But it's not true. Values 
are important, but they are contextual in the context of local communities, particularly. Because values have to do with how people interact with each other and what people do. So there's a difference between values in different parts of the world and in different communities. And so we can't start by saying, I've got these values, you should do them too. And that's why localism in terms of values is so important. And a lot of the battles over the recent years are ideological ones. And in ideological battles, it's really about one person saying, hey, I think this is important, you should think it's important too. Now, of course, there are some basic values that we should share, like life is precious and we shouldn't be wasting it. We really should sustain it. And unfortunately, we're not all showing that we have those values today in the coronavirus outbreak. But, but we really should have those values. Um, and and the, so there are some basic values that we want everyone to share. But those should be very few. And mostly we should be saying, well, everyone should adopt their values and it doesn't have to be the same values that I have. And that's what localism and values and multi-scale values in relation to society is all about. And again, multi-scale is the same sense of in the body, right? A, a heart cell and a blood cell and a muscle cell, the way we understand their values is their behavioral choices. And it's very obvious that they don't have the same values and they shouldn't be the same values in society either. But they should align to the, the greater good or the, the whole, you know, with reference to the, well, the body, the organism. Yeah. Even that, you know, we usually, uh, we know, right? I mean, even in society, there are these people who are, are, um, are trying to break into servers. Some of them are the bad guys and some of them are the good guys. The good guys are the ones that once they break in, they tell you about it. Mm. The bad guys are the ones that exploit it for real. So it's a little bit subtle sometimes to realize what is the difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you had a, a message to share with the world, but particularly those with um, massive amounts of institutional power, um, what would you say? I think one of the challenges that we face today in institutions is the can't do attitude. Bureaucracies, if you think about it, their whole existence is based upon telling people we can't do stuff. And we've seen that all over in this outbreak. And, and again, going back to China, they didn't say, I can't do this. They said, what do we need to do in order to stop this? And and I, we should at least spend a few minutes talking about what we need to do about this outbreak because we still haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, yeah, well, let's, let's, let's go there. So what do we need to do? And the first thing we need to do is to stop thinking that we can't do stuff and stop thinking that it's very expensive or that there's a trade-off between lives and money because there isn't. The relevant variable today in the outbreak is how many people get sick and the cost financially and the cost in human lives is, is both related to the same thing. And, it's, and this whole idea of the trade-off between them and we've got to balance them or something like that is, is frankly pretty crazy. And it's crazy in general, but in a pandemic, it's just insane. And what we need to do is to figure out what we have to do in order to stop the outbreak. And the first thing, and, and, and I've written a piece called How to Win, and a lot of the work that I've been doing is just trying to explain to people what we need to do and that we can do it. And if we do it, it'll only take a few weeks to stop the outbreak. So let's do it and get it over with and go back to normal. That's what we need. So the first thing that we talk about is that we need to do as much as possible to get everyone to be on board with stopping the outbreak. Because government needs to take action, whether it's national or local. We need to have people who are on board. If, if the people are not doing what needs to be done, it's not gonna help if the government does stuff. And, and vice versa. Um, and 
and the companies have to do what's right. And other institutions, every, everybody has to be on board. So we have to galvanize people to do the right thing. That's number one. Number two is, is this, what, what people are calling a lockdown, which is social distancing. We really have to make sure that we don't transmit the disease and we have to recognize that even within families, most of the disease transmission happens at home. And so we have to do as much social distancing as possible. And part of that is the third thing is doing isolation. As soon as you know that someone is sick, I mean, this is the, this is the thing that you do, whether you're in Africa and Ebola or whether you're in the rest of the world, as soon as someone is sick, you don't send them home to their families. How crazy is that? And we're doing that in many places, including the United States. And, and why would we want to do that? Not only that, we're even sending people that are sick in nursing homes, we're sending them back to the nursing homes. How crazy is that? You can't isolate Thank people. You, it's, it's, and, and the reason why they're doing it is that we can't, right? We can't do what they did in China of creating you know, facilities for people. That's nuts. It would help us, it would save lives, it would shorten the outbreak, it would reduce the economic impacts. It's, it's just a matter of perspective that they say we can't. All the time at the beginning, they were saying we can't do lockdowns, and then they did lockdowns. And we can't, we're not gonna do masks. Oh, oh, I guess we can do masks. So the next one is masks. So we need isolation of people away from their families. Create a safe family program where people don't go home to their families. If the doctor told you, hey, you're sick, I can't keep you in the hospital here, but you can't go back to your family because you'll infect them. Well, people would find solutions to that problem. They would, but they're not yet doing that, and they should. So that's the isolation piece. Then there's the masks, and masks is protecting people from transmission. And then there is the, um, uh, the travel restrictions, which is, I mean, why would we want the disease to go everywhere? There's just a map of, of um, there's data that released now in Massachusetts where I live, and the disease is almost everywhere. Why would we do that to ourselves? We could easily have stopped it from getting everywhere by localizing it, by having some travel restrictions. And we even have a lockdown. So the travel restrictions are not that big a deal. You just have to draw a boundary and say, hey, if you go across this boundary, you have to do essential travel. And yeah, yeah we'll make sure that you don't have fever. We'll take your temperature. Uh, and by the way, let me know where you're going because you know, we have to make sure that this is not just for frivolous things and you'll transmit the disease with you. Which makes sense. And it also is necessary for releasing the, the outbreak. Because how are you gonna relax the restrictions on the outbreak? You're gonna wait until there are no cases everywhere and then you're gonna relax the restrictions? How crazy is that? You know, I, Wyoming is gonna wait until New York has no cases before they open up their activities there. Because there are still 100,000 people flying all over the country and driving on the highway. So you can never be sure that you're not gonna have a case tomorrow. Hmm. So you need the travel restrictions. It's kind of necessary. So I have no doubt that they will do it because it's no pr not practical otherwise. At least I hope so. Hmm. Um, so that's travel restrictions. And then you have to make sure that the essential services are safe. So there's this meat packing plant or this other thing that people are doing. And, and all of a sudden there are hundreds of, hundreds of people that are sick because they weren't careful. So whatever businesses you're running, and if you're going into a retail place, you don't wanna go into the store, you wanna pick it up curbside, or you wanna have it dropped in your car in the trunk, or you wanna have it delivered, which is the best thing. And everything has to be set up so that you have no contact because you wanna make sure that people are safe. And then there are a couple more, and I think I've covered all of them, but I should check just to be sure. So this is um, a how to win piece that I yep. wrote. Lockdown, isolation, wear masks, travel restrictions, essential services, ah, testing. You gotta have testing. You can't fight something you can't see. 
And one of the things don't, people don't know is that everybody thinks that the testing is DNA testing and that's the right testing, but there are other ways to get information. And, and it turns out that one of the best ways is actually CAT scans, CT scans. The CT scans tell better even than RT-PCR, the, you know, the DNA RNA test, whether you have a, a, a something in your lungs. So they actually have a very low false negative rate. They have a false positive rate because it could be pneumonia, but that you can get rid of afterwards by doing the RT-PCR test. But the fact that you have a very low false negative rate means that you can isolate people and not have transmission. And it also means that you can, um, uh, you can, it actually turns out you can tell even in many cases before you have symptoms. So you can take people who are close contacts of someone who is positive and test them and find out if they're sick even before they know it. So CAT scans should be done, CT scans should be done, and they haven't been done, but in China they use them extensively, in Iran they're using them extensively, and I, I'm not sure about Italy because I, I haven't received a report about it. But in fact, this, the RT-PCR considered to have such high false, ne false negative rates that in many places they don't consider them to be effective. Um, so testing is key. And, and the part of the point is that if you do enough testing, then you really can find out if a place is clear of the disease. And then you can focus on other areas and eliminate the disease from other areas. So this geographical business of where it is and where it isn't, you really want to break up the country or the, or the state as much as possible into local regions that you can separate so that you can really quickly understand what's going on and then relax restrictions because that's key. Mm. And the last two are having to do with health as opposed to transmission. And one is health guidelines, which means you can worry about your own health. Even if you get the disease, it doesn't have to be severe. 80% of cases are not severe. So there's got to be these things that you can do that will shift that percentage. And we don't know exactly what will do that, but there are some clues. Number one, you can do the usual things if you have a cold. Drink a lot, eat well, sleep well. And one of the things that many people don't know is don't, put, don't take medicine for your temperature. Uh, it turns out that that's part of your immune response. It may not feel good. That's why you don't have high temperature all the time. But when your immune system has to do stuff, it really helps it. So let it go up, 101.5, fine, no problem. Even 103 is okay. Over 103, it can become, become dangerous. Take something to reduce the temperature. And the last one that I would point to is, is just about breathing. Respiratory health. This is a respiratory disease. So what you want to do is you want to do exercises to strengthen your cardiovascular system. You want to breathe a lot of fresh air when you're sick. And, and there's one thing that is, turns out to be special thing, but maybe really important. And that is in a complex system sense, what's happening in your body is kind of like what's happening in the world. The virus is going from one part of the lung to another part of the lung. And you don't want that to happen. But how does it get from here to there? And the answer is, it cannot get in the body until later, until you have a really se severe case. So the way it does it is kind of the obvious way. You breathe it out, and then you breathe it back in. See that? Yeah, that, that wasn't aware. So if you breathe it out and you breathe it back in, you get an infection in a different place. So breathing it out can infect someone else, but it can also infect you. So what should you do? And the answer is you should breathe out and in different air. So you should be outside breathing out and breathing in in a different direction or out of a window or in your home, what do you do if it's too cold out? And the answer is an air filter is probably, air purifier is probably a really good idea because a HEPA air filter will capture almost all the viral particles. So it's really good to make sure that you're breathing fresh air 
and you're not rebreathing your own viral particles. Mm. I think so. It seems like the right idea. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. That's really good to know. And the last one in terms of recommendations is just the medical thing. We want to save as many people as we can. And if people get sick, we surely don't want them to infect more people. We don't want them to infect the doctors and nurses. And we want to give the doctors and nurses everything we can in order to save lives. And, and it's so dangerous because we can easily overwhelm the system. So we need to make sure that they have the right precautionary, the, the, the right thing, like PPEs, personal protective equipment, masks, gowns, face shields, ventilators, you know, and so on, and isolation units for patients and all kinds of stuff that they need in order to save lives. And we've been pretty bad about it because, again, it was small until it was too large. And at that point, we said, oh, no, we made a mistake. And so we started isolating. We started, we started uh, doing lockdowns. But, you know, um, we really didn't have to do this altogether. We could have stopped it before it got to the U.S. or anywhere else in the world except for Wuhan, China. Mm. Well, we're, we're coming close to, uh, to wrapping up. Um, if people want to uh, find out more about how they can contribute uh, perhaps more substantively, other than the, the list of interventions you mentioned, if people have skills that they think could be of use in their own communities or elsewhere, uh, where should they um, direct their attention? So the main thing is to do stuff. But if you want to collaborate with other people who want to do stuff, we, I sent out a call for volunteers about a month and a half ago. And they've coalesced in, a, in what's called a Slack system, which is an electronic coordination system. And the website that we're using is called end, E-N-D, coronavirus.org. And there's also a new community interaction system called at community.endcoronavirus.org. So between signing up, say, click on a join us link and sign into the Slack channel and channels and, and join a group, either local eff efforts or if you're good at you know, writing or graphics or if you're good at technology or, or if you want to work on innovation, um, please join us. There's a lot of things to do. We have a lot of really uh, good people who are working together to try to, to stop this outbreak and to help inform people. Also analytics, I didn't mention everything that we're doing, but everything from you know, building and planning ventilators, designing masks, all the way to doing analytics, to writing communications and to organizing uh, for you know, influence to make sure that policymakers mm do better actions than they might otherwise do. Yeah, well, all those links I'll, I'll share in the show notes and um, I'll share your social media profiles and your website so that people can uh, can follow you. But um, yeah, Nia, I just want to thank you for the work that you've been doing because I have no doubt that uh, your actions have saved tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not you know millions. So thank you very much for the work you've been doing and for being such a, uh, so, so vocal and um, especially in this time. The world is better off for it. Thank you very much. And, and again, I, I think the, the, the statement is everyone can do stuff. People have to understand that they have the ability to make a difference. When there are these kinds of events, it's really about everybody doing what they can. So welcome everybody to help. And I look forward to seeing you uh, in, in this uh, effort.